Thank you uh, for being here. And I've said, <clears throat> said it once already, but it's because of the seriousness of God's people getting together. We should never take it for granted that um, you'll even show up. But we're grateful that um, you've trusted Christ and you know what you ought to do as believers. And we can be encouraged together as we serve him. I don't know if you've had this experience yet, but this has uh, been very interesting to me since the time that we've uh, moved back to Macon County. You go to a restaurant and um, the service is slow. I mean, really slow. And then you sort of ask somebody, and they said, oh, we're short of help. Um, we need help. I went to... Uh, one of my favorite places, good old Cracker Barrel. And um, I got to quit being lighthearted, I think, because I went in. There was a few cars in the parking lot, but there was no one waiting in line. And um, so I went in and just said to the lady in a jokingly way, how long is the wait? And she said, 20 minutes. Now I'm saying, wait a minute. I'm pulling her leg and she pulling my leg. You know, there's nobody around. And then she says, we only have two servers. So if I let you go in and sit down now, you're going to be upset when no one can get to you for 15 or, or, or 20 minutes or so. And it just reminded me that the world, this world system that we live in, all of this shortage of help, I mean, you go into the big box stores, nobody to wait on you. I mean, you, you're, you're kind of on your own. You got to kind of know what you want to get. And then I was thinking about a great text that's really, our missionaries use the text all the time, Matthew chapter 9. And it's a great uh, missionary text when they come to churches um, looking at the field and how ripe the field is, ready for harvest, but there's not enough workers. And it dawned on me that, you know what, in our local churches, we shouldn't be like these public places because God has planted people in our church and the people God has planted in our church, all, A-L-L, -L, have gifts and talents. There isn't a person in this building that's born again that doesn't have at least one spiritual gift. So really, we shouldn't be at a want for people to help us in the ministry. But yet and still, we, we, we have some openings in our ministry. And I just want to challenge you this morning because we're not the world. We're God's people we should join our hands and our hearts together to be that wonderful, powerful church that God has called us to be. See, one of the things about believers, don't just lull yourself to sleep waiting for that great day of the rapture and God snatches us all out of here. Until then, I'm suggesting to you that we have work to do. I mean, we got people that live all over this area. Can you imagine if God were to send all of them to us now, we couldn't even service them because we need teachers and we need helpers and all of these kinds of things. So this morning, as you listen to this message, and hopefully you're going to be encouraged by it, but allow the Spirit of God to speak to your heart in terms of what is your role at Riverside Baptist Church? You see, if your role is just to show up every Sunday, and those of us that are ministering in these different areas, we're supposed to do it all by ourselves, we're never going to be 10,000 people strong. Because there's not enough of us doing the work. But I would suggest to you, if we put our hands to the plow and we don't look back, watch what fabulous things God will do for our church and in the hearts and lives of others. Now, we're not going to hold up God's work by any means, so don't, don't misunderstand me. If, you know, if we decide that we just want to not do it, that the work isn't going to get, it's going to get done. 
It's just that we don't get a chance to share in the glorious work of God. See, being a Christian to me is really special. See, we've been called out from the world and God says, I want to use you to bring honor and glory, not to Riverside Baptist Church, but to bring honor and glory to none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself, our Savior. And we say that a lot, don't we? But what are we doing to honor him with our gifts and talents that he has given to us? So this morning, this is our call. Help want it. And we're going to be looking at Matthew uh, chapter 9, and we're going to be starting in verse 35. Father, thank you again um, that you allowed us to be able to share uh, the word of God once again with your people. And we just pray for open and receptive hearts as we prayed earlier. And Lord, we know that um, you indeed are on the throne. We know, Lord, that you have a time that you're going to come back to this earth and you're going to take your people home with you. But until then, Lord, help us to be faithful servants of the Most High God. Help us to be faithful with our gifts and our talents that you have given to us. Once again, encourage our hearts from your word as we share this particular passage. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 we see where Jesus was traveling all throughout this region. And some people say there was 200 plus villages um, that he went to in, in terms of villages and cities that was in, in this particular area. Three things that the text tells us that he was doing. He was teaching, he was preaching, and he was healing. He had an active ministry going on. And in the prior verses to, to, to our verse that we're looking at uh, this morning, Jesus, you know, was, was healing people who were, who were sick. He restored the uh, life of a, uh, of, excuse me, restored the life of, of a young girl, Jairus' daughter. He healed the, the woman. He healed two blind men. The, the, deaf, the mute man was able to speak again. And then he comes up against this group in verse 35. And verse 35 tells us this. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease that was among the people. That was his ministry back then. Now, remember, one of the things that was going to be going on, he's already done this beforehand. But now the text narrows it down for us. In verse 36, the, the text tells us, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. These leaders, these hypocritical leaders, these um, the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees and all of these people who were harassing the people. And the, this idea of the word harassment means that they were troubled and distressed and helpless. They were thrown down. Have you ever looked around Macon County? Have you went to the mall, the restaurants, downtown, wherever you might go? Have you ever looked into the faces of some of the people who walk around our community. They're hurting. You can see it in their faces. Now, in this particular context here, the problem here were the religious leaders because what Jesus ended up saying is that they were, they were scattered as sheep having no shepherd. And one of the things that the synagogue leaders of this particular day they wanted to be the power brokers. They wanted to be the ones in control. They hated Jesus. 
Because what was happening to them is they were losing out on all the authority, all of the extra rules that they made up in terms of the law and all of these kinds of things. They were burying the people. That's why they were so distressed, so heartbroken, excuse me, in their lives. They were completely and constantly discouraged. I don't know if you've ever been discouraged or not, but that's a very difficult state to be in when life just seems to have just overwhelmed you in such a way that you don't even know where you're going. You don't even know what you're doing. You're frustrated in the things of life. But Jesus here in verse 36, the Bible tells us that he was physically moved by the plight of all of these people. One writer said this, that he was literally sickened by the poor leadership of Israel's hypocritical religious leaders in terms of how they were treating the people. And when we see the text again in verse 36, the savior of the world was moved with compassion when he saw the condition that these people were in. Are you moved with compassion when you look around Macon County? Do you look at the people and wonder, boy, they need a savior. Or boy, why are they under so much pressure and, dis and distress in their hearts and in their lives? But we have the advantage. We get to come to a wonderful church, wonderful building. We can sit here. We can hear music and we can listen to a good message. We can say amen. We can put our tithes and our offerings in the box in the back. We go home and we're going to enjoy a nice picnic in the afternoon, Labor Day weekend. And we're just having the time of our lives. But our Savior, our King, and our Lord was moved with compassion when he saw the pain, the agony, the hurts of the people all around him. Verse 37, he makes this statement. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful but the laborers are few. You see, when we look around Macon County, there is a ripe harvest out there. We have friends, neighbors, and relatives, people within our own families who we know are outside of the arc of safety. Do we care? Do we care about Uncle Bob, Aunt Mary, or even our own siblings, who we know, theologically we know this, that if Christ were to come today, they would be left here. So when we look out at this field called Macon County, there's a whole ripeness that's out there. There are people who need the Lord. You're probably familiar with that song, and as God gives us grace, I know my wife's going to not be happy with me, but one of the days we're going to have her sing that song for you. People need the Lord. Folks, people need the Lord. And if we have the Lord in our hearts and in our lives, and there's no compassion on our part for the loss, what does that say about us? Jesus himself said that we were salt and light. We can make a difference in people's lives, but we have to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news that men and women and boys and girls, they need. And they need to hear this message desperately because there's plenty of them out there. But now we need laborers to go out into the field. This message was preached much better than I'm probably doing today by some missionaries that I've heard in times past. And it burdened my heart to think about, here are these people living in the United States of America. Where things are reasonably well, we 
food, water, and all this stuff, and health care, and all this. But yet and still, they felt the call of God to go to some third world country, in the case of foreign missions. And I used to scratch my head. And I realized the difference is simply this, is that they responded to the call of God. But I'm going to suggest to you that those of us that live right here in this town that we live in now, God is also calling us to make a difference in the hearts and the lives of people. Because when we go out there and look, and maybe this is the problem, we don't want to go out there and look to have that compassion. But when that strikes your heart, that here's men and women and boys and girls who need to know the Lord, how can I be a part of that? If you ask God that question, he's going to answer. He's going to tell you exactly how you can become a part of that. Jesus' passion for the needs of the crowds caused him to ask his disciples to pray for workers to go out into the harvest. Jesus points to two great facts. The harvest was abundant and the workers were few. I don't know theologically, I hadn't really thought about it that much until um, lately. But isn't it interesting to you in verse 37 that he sees this multitude, he has compassion on them, he says that they are like sheep scattered, having no shepherd. And then in the very next verse, what he does, he tells us that the, that the harvest is truly plentiful, but the labors are few. He seems to be making a strong emphasis on we need laborers to go out in this field to be able to share the good news. That always kind of amazed me. It seemed like there'd be some more emphasis on those who were lost. But in verse 38, he says this, therefore, pray the Lord, uh, Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. We need workers. As we walk around Macon County, do we still see troubled, thrown down people? One writer said this, that some Christians today seem to point, seems to view non-Christians with fear. But Jesus didn't. He saw them with compassion. And there's no one saying go out and do anything foolish, but this is what we are saying. Make yourself available. Make yourself available that you're willing to trust God in what he wants to have done. We say that we want to do many more things with our church. As we gather more people in our church, we can support more missionaries. And as more missionaries go out, maybe Lord willing, even through our own church, we may be able to send out a missionary or two. See, it's possible. You see, you may not have the desire to go, and maybe God hasn't necessarily called you to go. But those that he called, you and I ought to be excited and supportive of those who are willing to go and just give of their lives to serve God. Missionaries who's been on the field for 40 years. Some of us, we look at our lives for 40, well, we've, uh, we've been on vacations, a uh, couple new cars, college on the lake, maybe a little boat out here on Lake Decatur and all that. But we have people who have felt the call of God to give of their lives for 40, 50 years serving the Most High God. Help want it. That's what we're talking about. Help want it. 
And in a moment, we're going to give you a, a, a description of the help wanted, even for our own local church. There are things that we need to have done right here, right now in our local church. The workers are few, the text says. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our job is now to pray for more laborers to enter the field. You may misunderstand me a little bit because you may be thinking that I'm telling you that Riverside is calling you to do more work. I'm not saying that. You know what I'm saying? Jesus is calling you to do the work of the ministry. See, it's, you can turn down Pastor Jay, Pastor Travis, the elders. You can turn down Riverside Baptist Church. Can you turn down the Lord? The one that gave himself for you. I don't know if you think about Calvary or not, but periodically I do. I was sharing in Sunday school this morning. One of the things about me is I know how bad I am. See, I don't know how bad you are, but I know how bad I am. But yet and still, the God who created heaven and earth would allow his son to go to the cross. He who knew no sin was made sin that those who are the redeemed of the Lord might have the righteousness of God imputed to them. It's amazing, folks. See, we sit around somewhat comfortable. We do. We enjoy life. We enjoy this area and whatever it is that we do. Did God enjoy having to send his son to a cross for people that didn't even love him. But yet and still, in these last days in which we're living, therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out more laborers into his field. In these last days in which we're living, and God is calling us, to come and serve him and work for him. In this particular case, we're talking about in this place. I'd like to believe that every one of you here are here because God has planted you here. And if God has planted you here, we got work to do. We got a community that we can serve. We got folks within our church who needs encouragement. And so this morning, as we consider this idea of help wanted, what are you willing to do for others outside of yourself? Because it's easy to take care of self. But it requires a little bit more effort to take care of others. And matter of fact, there's probably some of us in this church, well, you know, I mean, I, I, I'll help anybody except for that guy, whoever that guy is. Isn't it interesting how we are? But you know what's really interesting? Whoever you are individually, God saved your soul. And guess what? He knew exactly what he was getting when he saved you. Let's rejoice together. Let's be the kind of church where people all over the state of Illinois will know about us. See, sometimes we say, oh, I don't know. Why would you say that? God saved you. He's given you a gift. So when you go on vacation, you go somewhere. And you say, I'm from Decatur, Illinois. I'm from Macon County. I'm from wherever. Oh, you're from where that Riverside Baptist Church is. You've heard me say this before. See, I believe it's possible because I believe nothing is impossible with God. 
And by the way, we're not asking you to do anything that you're not gifted to do. We're just saying, use the gift that God's given you. We shouldn't have a list of things on our bulletin that we need help with. And we have this many people in our church. It ought to be a waiting list for helpers. We ought to have a waiting list for Sunday school teachers. By the way, we still meet Wednesdays at 630. So if you bring your children even to Awana, stay for Bible study. And those of you who are able on Thursday mornings at 9 o'clock when we have our prayer meeting. See, one of the things that I believe very strongly in when we uh, have messages like this is that, listen, when things are going its best, that's when we ought to be praying like there's no tomorrow. See, the problem with humans sometimes, when things are well, I mean, we'll do it a little bit, but boy, let our house burn down. Let us get a negative message from our doctor. We want all the prayer in the world. We want to be on everybody's prayer list. But on Thursday mornings, there's five of us that get together to pray for all of these things. There's seven or eight of us that get together on Bible study on Wednesday nights. But yet and still, we say, Lord, I love you with all my heart. Lord, I'll give you my life. My all in all. It's challenging, folks. These are in time. We have no idea what tomorrow is going to bring. Whether it's an accident or whether it's a dirty bomb from North Korea. We don't know. But until then, shouldn't we put our hand on the plow and not let go? Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. And you're familiar with Isaiah 6. That's the, the verse that um, tells, excuse me, let me read it for you. That's the verse where when the prophet goes before, he says, listen. He says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. And a train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, and each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole world is full of his glory. And the posts of the doors were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe to me, I am undone because I'm a man of unclean lips and dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Now, what's interesting, as we read the rest of this, we see that he identifies himself. Look at me. I, man, I'm a man of unclean lips. I know how bad I am. And then, excuse me, we, 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 we read, and he says, says this. <clears throat> I'm sorry, verse 6. Then one of the seraphims flew to me, having the heaven in his hand a live coal which he had taken with the tongues from the altar and he touched my mouth with it and said behold this has touched your lips your iniquity has been taken away and your sins has been purged 
Folks, there was a point in time in our lives, those of us who claim salvation, the redemptive process when it hit us, our sins were taken away, never to again to be remembered by the Lord. We're never going to be held accountable for them because at the cross of Calvary, it was finished. It was totally done. Now, at the end of this particular text is basically what I want you to hear. He says that um, uh, after his, his, his iniquities were taken away and his sins were purged, he says this. And also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And he ends by saying this. Then he, I said, here I am, Lord, send me. Our needs that we have in our church. Are you willing to listen to the needs? Are you willing to consider the fact that your sins have been washed away? Have you considered the fact that in the eternal state, you're going to be living with a holy and just God for all of eternity? And so now when the job opening comes up, are you willing to say, here I am, Lord, send me. You ever think about that? The Great Commission, which you all know very well. Matthew um, 28, 19 through 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. As you are going is the emphasis here. See, it presupposes pre that we're going to be willing to go because we got to go back and, ah, Calvary. Calvary covered it all. We say all of these things. But see, isn't it interesting that God's not asking us to do anything that we're not capable of doing? Remember the gifts and the talents that God has given you? As you are going, these are the things that you ought to have in your hearts and in your minds. The gifts of grace found in Romans chapter uh, 12. Let me just read these to you and we'll be almost done. For by grace, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, you ought not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one, and the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. We all have gifts. We are part of this body, and not all the people within the body have the same gift. The gifts vary varies as God has given us grace. And the key to the whole thing is an old-fashioned saying is, let us learn to stay in our lanes. The gift that you have, that's where you ought to be. And you've heard me say this before, and the reason this works out so well is you, some of you have appreciated um, the fact that, that my wife is gifted in singing. 
But have you noticed something about her? We've never done a duet. <laughs> have you noticed that since I've been here? Have you seen her say, well, me and my husband are going to sing a song together? It wouldn't go over well, fellow people. I know. I know what my gifts are, and I'm going to stay in my lane. And the fact that, that Romans tells us that we have these grace gifts that God has given to us, when we look at our church outside on the, um, in the foyer, there's a list of needs that we have. But some of the needs that we have even now is we need welcome center workers. We need an Awana commander. We need Awana leaders. We need a teacher and assistant for senior high class. We need teachers for primary class. And we need other ministries, another help within the ministries that's both listed out there. And you talk to Pastor Travis about that. In a church this size, this list should very quickly go away. Because, the, excuse me, because of the, what the Word of God re, reminds us of is that the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. What do you want God to do for you? Are you praying about your job? Are you praying about a promotion? Are you praying about this and that and the other things? But isn't it interesting, God's simple request of his people? Look out there among the fields. Look at the people. They're downtrodden. They're discouraged. They're thrown down. But the problem that we have is that we need some laborers. And I look around the room and I see a room full of laborers. And in this sense, I'm saying, let's start with our church. Let's get some of these vacancies filled and let God just begin to send people in. We got a full complement of Sunday school teachers. We have a full complement of nursery workers and all of these things. Let's just trust God that he'll do all the filling. We just want to be faithful. And that's the interesting word. Because that's, that's Jesus in his conversation in the New Testament tells us this very simply. If you love me, keep my commandments. I mean, I'm just saying, okay, if you love me, come to church every Sunday. If you love me, give more money. If you love, he didn't say that. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. One of the things about obedience, all of the other stuff comes along with it. See, learn to obey. Obedience is better than sacrifice. And we learn that in the Old Testament. So, right now, first Sunday in um, September, we have a help wanted sign up all over the place. We need you. We need your gifts and your talents. And what we're going to try to do is every couple of weeks, we're going to tell you about the jobs that are no longer available because some of God's people decided to step up and let him use them in this capacity. I love what I do. I love you guys. I really love you guys passionately. You don't even know how much I love you guys. Because I believe that God is at work in these last days in which we live. And he just wants us to be faithful. See, we're different than the world because God has saved our souls. And I hope that through this that you'll pray. Lord, what is it that I can do for the church that you've placed me in? Because I want to be faithful, Lord with these gifts and these talents that you've given to me 
That way, when some challenge or difficulty that comes over my life, I know that you're in control. You said you would never leave me or forsake me. Pray, and he'll answer. Father, thank you again for our time together. Thank you for the help wanted sign. You've given us gifts and talents. You've called us to this particular church. So this is the place that we ought to work together. Help us to hold our hands together, join our hearts together, and help us to make a difference in this community in which you have placed us. And we'll be sure to give you the thanks. In Jesus' name, amen.